Hello everybody, welcome to Stoke Sound Podcast. Today we have the most amazing producer, mixer, musician, everything, Joe Rodwell. Joe, please introduce yourself. Hi, I am Joe Rodwell. Is that good? <laughs> That's that the introduction? Yeah, thanks. That was a very nice intro to me. Um, I do not actually, I'm going to just dump into this. Uh, somebody said to me, there was, because I feel like I fall under that thing, you know, uh, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. But there, apparently that is only half the saying, which made me feel really happy. And the other is, it's, um, oh, it was something about, uh, I wish I remembered it exactly, but it was, you know, it's like, but if you are a master of one, then you haven't really lived. So it was something like that. So it made me feel better <laughs> that I try reversed. and do everything. Yeah. And tr I try and do everything. And it's like, you know, I feel like I'm, you know, the more I do bits of everything, the better I get all those. It just takes a little bit longer. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. It's time. Yeah. I mean, but, obviously, Joe, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, what, you know, for the listeners kind of, you know. So, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I guess I primarily, I started my music world as a player. So I'm a trumpet player first and then keyboards second and guitar kind of fell down later, later down the line. Uh, and from that, I became a bit of an arranger. So I was arranging for my local marching bands and then into, you know, funk bands and jazz stuff as it went on. Uh, always had a love for music tech. Uh, I, I never studied music at school. I only ever did the tech side. As soon as I could get into anything music tech, it was like, I know this is what I want to do. Yeah. So I love for electronic music as well as my kind of acoustic-y, you know, brass. Uh, Best of both worlds. Like performing. Yeah, I try to just combine the two uh, and still try to combine the two as much as I can. And now, yeah, I'm mostly working as a producer, um, occasional bit of recording engineering as like we how we know each other i guess yeah <laughs> uh, and uh and doing a lot more mixing now actually that's that's become but that's why i wanted I, you on to the uh to the podcast yeah because, that's it i yeah. mean i i i i I've mixed i tend to mix my own productions not always i sometimes i have you know say often it's a budget thing but you know uh it's i like mixing my own productions occasionally it's nice to go here you have it but um, I'm I like getting in there early and kind of starting the mix process as I'm producing, uh, yeah. and now I'm starting to get a lot more mix work, which isn't stuff I've produced, which is quite how, nice. To how do, do you and, find that? Diff do you find you're mixing differently? Uh, with... I mix so differently when it's not my production. Yeah, it, it... I think I mix properly when it's not my production. <laughs> if that makes sense, like I think is is explain very... further. <laughs> uh, I think because uh, uh, there's that always that awful thing and I I try I tried the whole process of going right the production is finished now I'm going to bounce out all my stems and I'm going to treat this like a mix but I, I just never yeah. I never really did that uh, so I think the problem with that when you are mixing your, your own productions is you do tend to go oh I might tweak the production which is going to help the mix yeah so it's like what's what's happening here is like oh, there's, there's something that the, i'm something's not working in the mix and actually what it needs is either something taken out or something added in and you can do that as a producer mixer so it's like it's, it, it, yeah. the going back and forth can happen i try and too many options <laughs> yeah whereas mixing is great so cool i've got these stems i need to make them work as well as i can with what's there i mean you, you know you might do a little bit of drum replacement you might do a little bit of other bits of replacement but most of the time you're working with you're given something you go cool i'm gonna make this work and it's yeah. much easier to, to to sort out and do templates and stuff like that i think when you're getting stuff received that's this is why i always ask for like rough mixes i mean i don't oh, yeah. you know i know a lot of people that say oh no you know you know I, i'm a mixer and i'm gonna put my mix sound on it and you know all of that and you know that does work for some people but for me i always find if i'm if i get sent a rough mix and i match the rough mix fundamentally i.e mm -hmm. levels but i just make everything a bit cleaner and a bit mm -hmm. you know more i guess 3d dimensional yeah that's, that's everyone loves stuff it like, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that's that is, what the I mean, producers that's... you know <laughs> yeah and that's and you know uh working with artists you just know there's the, the demo love is is real it's really like they if they if there's a rough mix more often than not not always but more often than not that artist loves that rough mix and then can't wait to see what you're going to do to make it even better and it's like and yeah. you might change it and then just go oh it sounds different and it's like oh no <laughs> so, so yeah having a rough mix is so important you need to at least be hitting that to start with and then go right cool now i can kind of emphasize the bits that i think need to be emphasized and kind of yeah tidy things that need been need to be tidied but it yeah. doesn't have to be too much 
and I always find a lot of the time these days, you know, as, you know, as we said earlier, you know, your producer, mixer, musician, you, you know, you're doing a lot yourself anyway. And I always find when I'm getting stems that, you know, purely just to mix, so no production, normally mm-hmm. it's been done, like a rough mix has been done by the producer. But mm-hmm. I'm finding nowadays lots of producers are great mixers. Oh, like, yeah. Like yourself. I've had a lot of great rough mixes through. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So sometimes, you know, if I was to mix one of your records, Joe, I, pr- I probably wouldn't be doing much different to what you're already giving me. I'm you're, you're, You would be giving, all you'd be getting me to do is kind of just have a different kind of set of ears on it, you know, yeah. a second opinion, more so than actually changing the mix. And so I find that actually these rough mixes, like we were saying, they need to be very similar in a way, or, or they're well, starting the time, to become more similar. Obviously, yeah, I mean, it depends, but... You're working with when you're working with an artist. Often they want it to sound close to the final thing as possible. Anyway, so you kind of have to mix it a little bit. Even if you are giving it to a mix engineer, you are still having to make it. You can't get away with like going, "Oh, it'll sound great when it's mixed." Anymore, I don't think that. No, you kind of have to do a bit of it along the way. It wouldn't get approved uh, by the artist, would it? They would listen well, no, to it exactly. and be like, "What's going yeah. on?" <laughs> yeah, so it's um, it's a tricky one. It depends on the artist. Like you know, everyone's different, but uh, some people can if they know the process, it's a lot easier. Of course, uh, like newer artists like they it's 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 hard to explain that because it's it's a, such a new thing that you know there is this kind of yeah process of how things get finished um yeah yeah nice interesting so today we're going to be focusing on the topic of synths synthesizers in mixing mm-hmm. and you know arranging it as you're a producer as well so you'll know about arranging synths and stuff mm-hmm. and all of that all of those things that people like yeah. and i always find that, that synths is actually really important in a track especially in pop records it's it, you know it kind of as well as the drums and the vocal it, the, it holds that mid-range <laughs> yeah together no, that's it, it. it really does so you know we can start with you know talking about as you know different kind of synths uh yeah and different I think that's... ways of approaching a mixing side of a synth i mean you know. there's so many different yeah i mean synths cover such a wide variety of things but i guess i mean you could the easy starting definition is that are you recording hardware synths or are you using software synths uh, yeah well and, let's talk and, about both you know? yeah yeah i think i mean i i i tend to use hardware more now than ever i've got into serum a little bit more recently yeah. but i mean i started off and just learned logic's es2 synthesizer from and i just got i knew everything i still know you know st- still use it occasionally now but I, I really got nerdy about that yeah but the day i ended up having a real synth in front of me life changed a little bit and it's a is no denying it's a longer way around and there is commitment needed to a sound but it's still great. I think just the ability to just sit here. I mean, I've, my profit is literally there in front yeah. of me, and I can just you, you got know, profit. Go, very nice. Profit six, just the desktop Ooh. version. <laughs> into, yeah, um, and yeah, it's is the ability to just. I mean, I I don't tend to use presets when I'm using hardware. I'll I'll literally sculpt it, and I feel. The good thing about sculpting synths, and this is a different thing to anything like guitar or. I mean, yes, everything has ability, but your synth, especially a hardware synth, you can EQ and do everything almost before it hits your your converters. Yeah. So, you know, if Which it's is like... a very important part, I guess, of the synth. Yeah, I, that's it. And, you know, it's that you're, you know, Profit is a good... So it's got two two filters. It's got a low-pass filter and a high-pass filter. Um, what happens is you create a really great patch and it sounds fat and massive, but in the mix it sounds too big, too bloaty. So, but great. So you don't have to worry about putting an EQ in on the, on the, uh, you know, when you get to the computer, you can just t- put the high pass filter up a bit. So I feel so like you're there's mixing a lot of as you're recording in a yeah. way. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're sculpting a sound that fits the track. So I think you, there's the great thing. I mean, you can do that with software since you should and can do it with software since as well. It's just, yeah. you can do it hands on with the, with the profit and, I've got this thing as well, which is quite useful. That's that's my serum beta, although it doesn't really beat serum. You've got lots of toys. <laughs> oh, I know. And I, I feel like this, and people watching this might go, well, you know, I'll have a profit. And, and I, that's fair enough. Uh, I feel like if you do ever get a chance to use some hardware synths, just do it. Just make a project, borrow some of these stuff, and it may not be a route that you want to go down, but it's just fun. So it's worth, worth learning. And I think it's easier to learn. If you don't know anything about synthesis, I think it's a lot easier to learn from a hardware piece of gear because everything often is right in front of you and you can kind of 
yeah. and things. So, so if, on t- yeah. if, if you're if you're doing all of that kind of EQ um, moves before you're hitting your um, computer DAW, are you um, doing much in the box mixing that synth? So, or yeah, not really? Yeah. So, I mean... I, I was trying to think about this when you said about oh, what, how do you process synths, and it's it, it you know if it's a pad, it's a different to a lead, to a pluck, to a bass, yeah, yeah. whatever. But we can just talk generally speaking. Yeah, I think yeah. pads is kind of like where most people are using synths, right? So yeah. I think there's usually a couple of processes that are going on. I'm usually having a fab filter or just you know an EQ on. Not really doing that much. I'm often, again, just, I know I've said it, you know, I use the high pass filter, but I end up still usually just knocking a little bit more of the bottom end. It's just something you've got Depend- to do, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, it depends what it's Safety acting net. as. Because sometimes, I, I mean, I think sometimes I'll boost the low mid area if that, if it's, if the song requires, say you've got a really subby bass, but you don't have much filling in that like 150, 300 hertz area, then I might actually boost that that area a little bit more just to, uh, that's where you just get a lot of size so if it's coming in the chorus and you're just getting you want a big sausage of a chorus then that kind of does that yeah quite yeah. well um but, but pads i'm you know i i'm trying to do a bit more widening stuff a lot of the time so something like a chorus if i'm not using a chorus pedal or a chorus on the way in i will i think a lot of the time i'm ending up using micro shift the uh, um sound, sound toys. toys that's a great uh, plugin for anybody so listening good. to this get the sound toys bundle <laughs> oh you won't you you won't regret it i mean i don't use all their plugins but i but i use i would say five of them all the time like decapitator echo boy uh devil lock uh micro shift alter boy five yeah i mean i use those all the time uh se yeah. i like seiq as well the uh, that EQ oh is really yeah nice. yeah um, they've got a really good uh phone preset i use that once oh, I haven't tried yeah that. If, you, if you go to okay. their presets it's like i think it's called phone something but on the just, SEI, yeah, but it's SIE, just really good. The wrong way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I want to try that. Yeah, yeah, I don't say, yeah, and get sound toys. Yeah, wait till it on sale, and it's always fifty percent off at some like a th- two or three points of the year, and it's it's well worth it. Decapitator is worth it on its own. Like I think, what are you using decapitator for? I don't find I'm using decapitator that Ooh. much. So uh, I, this is a little tip. Uh, I think I, I, <laughs> giving I away your secrets, from, there, Joe. Uh, it's not my. It's, it's, I'm giving away somebody else's. Um, <laughs> I know it's. Um, I don't mind. I'm sure you won't care of me telling it. But um, the guy, I the guy who does a lot of shy effects is uh, mix engineering. He he was. We were talking. I, I record trumpet for him sometimes. So we were there, and yeah. uh, he uses and now I use a lot just the filters as a general EQ, and I do that a lot on vocals. I use it a lot. So I'll just like, you know, I'll maybe use a fab filter EQ just to kind of get rid of harm, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Ringing and things like that, you know, like, oh, yeah, like frequencies, that, you know. frequencies I don't like, you yeah. know, I'll do some you know, sharp pulls with that. But then, especially if it's on a bright mic, I think the the high cut on the decapitator is just gorgeous. It's just you just pull it back until it goes right. That's enough of the nasty frequencies taken out, and the yeah. same with the low. The low end is like cool, okay. Especially if you're trying to fit into a pop track and you need to kind of knock off quite a bit of the bottom end. It just, I don't know. I mean, it's just a filter, right? But it just, Do you it just does like it in it? such a very smooth way. I, yeah, I love it yeah. for that. And then you know, I'll just drive things a tiny bit. Um, mm. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. I don't. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I do use decapitator on on mixes, but it's not like. I, I know people love it and I don't get me wrong mm. I love it too but I just find I don't use it I use um, for, for saturation and stuff I use is it Spectre? Oh, a, I don't have that okay yeah I use that you know it's, but it's more it acts like an EQ but it's your EQing saturation instead of mm-hmm. actual EQing the sound if that makes sense uh, that would tie into another plugin I use for that a lot on synths which is uh, Vitamin the Waves Vitamin oh the plugin. Waves one what are you I using that, that for in synths? Uh, just to as an EQ, almost yeah, saturation. Yeah. But I'm using it. I'm not thinking of it as saturation, but it is doing that. Um, if I, it's I find, especially for synth basses and actually for bass guitar a little bit as well. If I just pull up that middle, the middle band, mm. then that's my small speakers sorted out. That's I that's see. like and listening to stuff that doesn't have anything below a hundred hertz won't matter because it will just that that's that that's my little speakers trick yeah. really, um, and then. Yeah, if like if I've recorded, in, especially if I've recorded in a hardware synth, 
and I wish oh, I wish I'd be cut off a bit higher and there's a little bit more high frequencies. Yeah. Vitamin again, those top two bands will just do that for me. I need to start using that one. I never use that. Because I always kind of my Yeah. Yeah, I mean what I might normally with a pad, so my processing is I use um R base on pads. Yeah. I'll use okay, R base or, or I'll use so if I feel like the especially what this actually goes on to the software sim. So sometimes I find if I'm getting like uh, a Jupiter style or mm-hmm. you know kind of pad or, or that kind of polyphonic kind of sound and I just don't think it's got that low end that's missing because mm-hmm. you know people always say it's got lovely low end and mm-hmm. our base 40 hertz our whack it on great. does a job yeah, right. <laughs> or uh, the uh, UAD pull tech oh yeah I, yeah I use the waves pull tech for yeah, the same thing, same thing. Uh, I mean I love it for that but that yeah, 30 yeah, hertz to 60 hertz mm-hmm. and uh, I tell you one one I actually used the other day which was amazing if you don't use it yet is the UAD voice of God oh we talked um, about oh, no oh no God particle we were talking about the other day but no yeah, voice, God of God, particle, voice of God yeah voice of God yeah. it's unbelievable oh, yeah. I'm not on UAD That's you're not on UAD thing. no no I I I didn't because oh. I didn't want to buy any hardware, <laughs> and now they don't. Now you don't have to have hardware because of the Spark. Was it? Is it UAD Spark? Oh, I just, right. I'm just fighting any subscription models at the moment. I just don't want to. Yeah, pay. I no, I don't blame you. I don't yeah. blame you. And I've got. I, if I if I can't do what I if I can't do what I need to do with the plugins I already have, because I, I bought, I don't know, I don't know how many plugins I've got, so many. Yeah. I don't need, I don't need to have more. Really. <laughs> I try not to need more. Every now and then one comes like, you know, when Soothe came out, like Soothe 2 is like a godsend, you know, it's just, do you use like, that on Sims? That, uh, no, not really. Do you I, know what? I, unless, that, I was going to say, that is the main plugin I use on Synths to take oh, harshness out of a Synth. I, I guess I'm trying not to be harsh in the beginning, like, I guess. But I mean, you're I, doing it the proper uh, way, Joe. <laughs> yeah, I yeah I'm, I might use it. I'm, I use it on basses. Uh, I really like. There's a setting. One of their presets is um, like melodic bass glue or something like that. It's called, okay. um, and that's just great for like managing really low stuff. So if you're doing like sub basses, yeah. it's, it's really good for just controlling. You know we can only hear what we can hear and it depends on our rooms at that point and it's just it's a little bit of a safety net for kind of making sure those low frequencies aren't po- you know, poking up above yeah, yeah. others and stuff. Yeah. but yeah no, I don't tend to use it on that um, oh. uh, it's interesting yeah. to know what people so if you have yeah. like a if you have like a um, synth pad then what's your kind of go to uh, chain for example for processing oh. a synth pad I mean, there isn't really a go to chain there isn't it's, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, the hope is that I don't use anything you yeah. know that's that's the hope and I, a lot of the time I try and aim for that so even if it's if for software synths as well I'm, I'm a big fan of alchemy which is in logic and serum yeah. I'm a big fan of now alright <laughs> dog admin um, yeah. <laughs> but the dog, yeah the dog's made uh, its so, uh, entry on the uh, podcast <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if I'm doing anything, it's usually just extra interesting stuff. So like like we said, micro shift on the chorus. I, I like a flanger, I like a phaser. Oh, phase mistress, another sound toys that I like that quite a lot. Yeah. Um, And depending what else is going on, if it's like the pad is just a pad, I'm not, I'm just trying to turn it down and keep it, comp- I might, I mean, I'll, at that point I'll use some compression just to keep it in a place. Yeah. Uh, if the pad is being part, of, is a is a bigger part of the song, then I I quite like having pads loud, but then having some kind of dynamic thing where the vocal is pushing it down, ideally mid side. If I'm stop, stop so you, is that mid side? Are you side chaining at mid side? Yeah, I like track space is quite good for that. So I'll get yeah. the track spacer pushing down the pad in the mid, not side, but you know, in the in the uh, in yeah in. So when the freq- the frequencies are being pushed down on the mid channels, but the sides are staying in the same place. So yeah. It's, that I quite like doing stuff like that. Um, and with, when it comes to side chaining with pads, I mean, that's where I mean, with certain types of music, and actually a lot of type of a lot of types of modern pop music use this, where they're you know they're side chaining everything to the kick, and I'm doing that too. It's great. Yeah. Uh, and do you use sometimes that kickstart not... plugin. Yeah, I was going to say I don't actually do it to the kick. Right. If it's, a, <laughs> if it's, if it's it. four on the floor, it's gr- you know, just I use Nicky <laughs> Romero kickstart. Or I quite like the cable guys. I don't know if you know the, the oh, shaper box. Yes. Oh, yeah, that yeah. thing is that thing's amazing. Uh, and so if I and now that, that's actually quite good. If I'm not say it's a track where there isn't a kick going on, uh, it's quite useful for just 
making stuff move a little bit so you can kind of draw your own LFO shapes almost and kind of just make it wobble in, you know, to a rhythm that a rhythm may not may not exist already in the track. Um, yeah, so I quite like yeah. yeah. So keep, yeah, I mean that's it. Pads are either there to fill or they're a lot of the time there to create. They want they want movement to make them interesting. Yeah, they create the energy of the track. Yeah. yeah. So uh, side chaining and making things move around a bit. So that's where your chorus and your phaser and flange and things like that. Subtle. I mean, I hate, I'm not a fan of flanging and phasing that much, but if you just do it subtly, it kind of just adds something. Yeah. Uh, and also, oh, yeah, wow and flutter, things like that. I love a lot of wow and flutter. J thirty seven is good for that. And yeah, uh, sketch cassette two. I should say, or one's good as well, but two's better. Um, that's pretty good for moving, making pitch warble stuff. But I just say, with a lot of the time with synths, I'm trying to get it right before any processing at all, because um, you can. Um, but then that's pads, and then when it comes to like things like plucks and stuff, then I'm often doing, I'm treating them like percussion a lot of the time. You know, I'm, I might use a snappy compressor to kind of get more out of that pluck. Like yeah, it's a good word to say. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm a big fan, and this is percussion as well, and anything that's kind of uh, transient heavy uh, of the Spiff plugin. That's really oh, good. Oh yes, yeah, but se- yeah. Oak Sound, same as yeah, suit. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I love that, and and sometimes I don't. I use it in the Delta mode. You know, where you're kind of hearing what it does to the sound. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you use that. Uh, if you put it in delta mode, then you can choose the decay. You can really get things kind of sounding really snappy. So you just you choose the length of your decay, and it's it's mostly focusing on the attack side. So it's, if you're wanting to cut through the mix, or I might, well, I'm going on too much, but it's oh, it's interesting. I might right? do yeah, that, or I might do it. I, I might do it as a bus. It's like a parallel thing as well. So if I want, especially if you want to automate it during a track where you want it to poke out a little bit more in certain parts and not others, so I might send it to a bus and have just a spiff. I see, I see. Oh. It extra. So. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Do, 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 do you, I find with like plucky stuff, I always find though that I, I don't know, how do you, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is getting it to poke out in the mix, but mm. for it not to, I guess multiband is, is one thing yeah. to use but i mean is there anything that you kind of is there any techniques that you kind of do to get it to kind of be f- the synth be forward in the mix because a lot of the electronic stuff you can really hear those synths like they're really forward yeah. but but sometimes they're not like really harsh they're kind of just right so yeah do, is I mean, there any there's not much super highs on those usually i find it's like you're, yeah. you're kind of you're aiming to i mean i'm thinking of that sound which is kind of like square wavy triangle wavy sort of or yeah. sometimes sine wavy sort of sound like the rather B's got a lot of that sort of stuff going on as well. You know, that's that's, um, that's better versions of that, better examples. But uh, <laughs> yeah, my cat's now uh, decided yeah, to come in. I like it. We had a cat <laughs> fur filter. It's very nice. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's at that point. It's it's about arrangement almost more than it is mixing. It's, that goes to a production level where if you want it to come forward and poke out in the mix, you want to make sure there's nothing else sitting in that area too much where it's going to be a problem yeah uh if you are this happens you know you get you get mix you get tracks through and you're mixing them and you go these plucks if i try and turn them up they fight with the vocal they or they don't you've yeah. got to find you've got to find what they're fighting against really um and there's not there's something to be said for like i was thinking about this earlier on like layering synth sounds on top of each other as well so say if you want them to cut through uh but not in the frequency range they do already layer yeah. it up with another synth sound which is even shorter and maybe maybe even white just white noise you know it's just adding a little yeah to the, just like an extra little attack to each to each of the sounds um i think that the layering thing is a really useful thing i've i do that we'll go back to pads a little bit if i want a pad to have a bit more sheen uh but the sound itself if i try to affect that sound it doesn't kind of work. It's kind of like, you know, you're playing with a high band. I'm not really finding the frequencies that work. Just layer another sound that does have those frequencies. Just blend it in slightly. I yeah. think synth layering is a wonderful, uh, weird and wonderful world where you can kind of, if something's not working for you, f- instead of trying to work on that sound, add another sound. And the, add the thing you, uh, the sound that really has the things you're looking it's for. A, it's a complete art form, isn't it? Synthesis. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's I just, do a lot of mid-side, yeah. e- going back to what you were saying yeah. about kind of getting it to fit, I always find when I'm 
when I'm mixing if I've if I've got like this kind of synth that's kind of in your face, but like you say, it could be getting in the way of the vocal. That's where mid side EQ comes in massively yeah. for, for me anyway. Uh, no, totally. Not everyone loves mid side EQ, but I always find that yeah. it works. <laughs> how, yeah, I don't. How much do you? I'm gonna. It's, you know, it's always it, as soon as you talk about mid side EQ, you go to this question. How yeah. how does it work in mono? Um, and do, are you a mono checker? Do you check things in mono? I it's interesting you say that I never used to be but I always check at the end of the mix I listen to the track in mono and the mm -hmm. way I the reason what I'm doing is is you know people always go well how loud should a vocal be right yeah. I always find if you check something in mono if the sounds that you're hearing are aren't bothering you level wise yeah. you're going to be fine in stereo that's yeah. kind of the way I look at it so I'd never used to check mono, but now I do because I always feel like it's checking in mono just makes everything more transparent. If you yeah, get the levels I think that's right, it. But I think I, I mean I don't do you? I don't or? care about mono as it depends what it depends on the genre. If you're in dance music world, I really check in mono a lot more because if it's being played out in a club, yep. more often than not, that's mono. You know, it depends on the club. You know, if it's yeah. if it's a stereo big stereo speaker set, amazing. But let's be, it mostly isn't, and it also if it, if it is. You, the speaker where they're placed is going to be not necessarily like and where the audience is they're going to be right next to the left speaker they're not hearing anything right speaker you, if you've got phase issues you're just going to lose some stuff right yeah yeah um yeah. so dance music is a different game but in general i tend not to care um like i will listen through and and you know then i'm just thinking key ingredients does the usually kick snare vocal bass do they sound are they working together yeah and not fighting each other uh, most important aren't they the kick yeah thing, but yeah yeah so those they're, they're your main ingredients your you, your groove your groove elements your main three groove elements and the, and the vocal and if they're working then it's fine i do mix in mono a bit more these days when um, you, what are you mixing in mono the synths so, or you know just in, uh, just I, in general I, in general and as i say sorry i i i i, I don't mix mono tracks i mix i i will how am I saying this? Usually, whenever I get a massive project, so like hundreds of tracks, strings, yeah. synths, keys, guitars, everything. When you got one of those tracks that does everything, <laughs> I will. I've got a button on my RME thing here that will put things in mono for me, and I start there. I if I because if there's so many, when there's so many elements, I need it. It's so much just hard, you know. It's like you're trying to balance these things. If I can get it to work in mono, at least for the first few hours of me mixing in that session. Then I know it's when I opened it to stereo, it's like, oh, even better now. So, so you okay. balance, you start your mix by balancing everything in mono. Yeah. Interesting. But not, not every time, not every time, but no. just uh, when it, when, when it's, a, it's, I know I get better results when it's a huge track by starting that way. Interesting. Um, there's one artist in particular I definitely did that with, um, a lady called Jaylee Small. She's amazing. But she has, yeah, like we did some tracks which were just huge, like, you know, uh, loads of layers of strings, like, Hundred vocal harmony layers. Oh wow! And like all loads of stuff that I lived bet in the computer same. Your computer love that. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> loads of stuff that just lived in the same area. Yeah, and it's just it's just so hard. And it, it, you know, um, it's so easy in that scenario to go. Well, I'll just push things to the sides, and then it's fine. It's like cool. You know, you, yeah. can, you can get away with this in the stereo fields. And no, I think if I can get it working at least a little bit in 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 the mono setting first. Then it's only going to sound better when you move it to stereo. So if I, I that's that's yeah, yeah. I, you know, I mean, I've got that's a really mix. good tip. All those listeners yeah. do yeah, this I on your next mix. Try it. See if it works. If you're struggling with a mix, I think it's a way to go. It's just like maybe not start from scratch, but just see if you can get it working in mono first, and then then yeah. you can figure it out. You know, and it's yeah, there there'll be space for everything somewhere. So do you know what I find though, especially with synths and stuff in tracks, I find that. I am doing so, like every single synth, not all the time, but I feel like most of the yeah. time I'm high passing quite a bit of stuff. It's so easy yeah. for synths to be so muddy. And I know it. obviously that boils down to, I guess, the producer at the beginning of that yeah. or whoever's doing it, you know, EQing it in like you were saying earlier. But I always find my all my mixes, I'm doing high pass, high pass, high pass, high pass <laughs> yeah, on yeah. most of the sims just because they're always getting in the way of either the sub or it's just not yeah. really necessary. I mean, do you find that as well? Or Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think, I mean, 
I'm a very good track duplicator. I do a lot of duplicate tracks of the same thing. So say yeah. in the verses there aren't isn't there isn't a kick and a bass maybe. So then that will have a different EQ setting to the same synth that happens in the chorus. If it's the same you know, same thing, you know, if the same thing happens, then I think you can treat things differently that way. But yeah, I mean, when there's when there's more stuff, I'm high passing more. It's always going to yeah. be the case. Like something needs to live down there, and it's often the bass. And usually, if the ba a bass in the chorus is probably got more stuff happening to it as well, so you might be adding like a core, you know, some micro shift to chorus or something like that, or some distortion, which is creating yeah. even more shit down there. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. More things <laughs> down there. It's all right. Beat me out. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, it, 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 that's getting busier. So it's that's it's, a very yeah. interesting point. The more stuff you have, the more you're high passing. That's um, anybody that tends to be. Yeah, I mean, anybody listening out there that's either new to mixing or more advanced to mixing, I I do think there is something to be said about that. I always find that if there is more stuff, you are a lot of the time, not all, there are yeah. going to be certain situations where you're not, but you are more often not high passing things. And I always say to people, and especially when it comes down to synths, is don't solo everything. Don't solo oh, your synths because it's so easy to solo a pad Mm. or you know and and just take all all the low ends because you think there's too much there and then suddenly you play it w with the bass and the bass is yes it's helping the low end but you're like well it still sounds a little bit thin and actually don't solo it and do your eq in context yeah. to the track and the mix I, I i i put my hand up and say i didn't do that for years and i don't know why because now that's i don't I mean, I solo things when I feel like there might be an issue. It's usually an editing thing I might need to yeah. do when I'm solo. Well, I solo stuff, as I level. I level, yeah, solo, yeah, yeah. Pick, solo snow, you know, and go on. You're listening. Yeah, you're kind of figuring out what's there and you're kind of listening to stuff. But but yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I, I think I'm stealing this from one of the big boy mixing, mixing engineers. But it's, uh, you know... Yeah see how your eq on your snare or oh yeah on your synth see how your eq on the synth is affecting the sounds around it that's true yeah yeah is it is it masking something is it is it helping something is it you know it could be all these sorts of elements that so yeah don't get get used to mixing not in solo uh, yeah. and you know and and also be aware that when you are focusing in on a sound it'll probably be too loud uh, and then yeah. you'll be like, yeah, it's like I'm really thinking about this. So I want to hear it more. And you turn it up a bit and you kind of go, oh, this sounds great. And then like 10 minutes later, you'll come back after making a coffee and go, oh, that's really loud. I'll turn it down. <laughs> but usually you've made the right choices. It's just, it's just too loud. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. And also, like when you're uh, recording or simps in, because I know, mm -hmm. you know, this question does get asked a lot, is, um, either latency from the analog going into the uh, DAW are mm -hmm. you you know are you a logic user for those listening and do you use flex and if so are you using that on your simps before you're processing them or you know how are you timing your simps because i said uh, this yeah last okay. time that the main thing i find about mixing is if like a lot of the tracks i get to mix i find a lot of the backing vocals aren't in time with the lead not always and uh, sometimes yeah. i'm just timing that send it back and they go what have you done ed and i go I haven't actually done anything. I've just timed it. So timing is so important. So, you know, tell us, tell I, I the think listeners. Actually, this is, a, what, yeah, yeah. It's any, anything, but timing is, it's just, it's the most important thing when it comes to, I think, and you, you really only see it sometimes at the mixing stage where it's like, yeah. the reason this impact doesn't work is because everything's not in time. Uh, and, you know, and it depends on the track, of course, but most of the time, things need to be in time, especially vocals. I mean, thank are you. Are you thank flexing? You are you, are you... Uh, for vocals, Vocaline now, but well, no, actually, I mean, now I use Melodyne. Uh, synths but, but since, yeah. so since, I mean, a lot of the time it's going to be MIDI pass yeah. So I do use Logic. So I'll, I'll um, use the external instrument plugin, whatever it is, or you know, uh, the settings, like a software oh, yeah. instrument, audio channel, external instrument. I'll use that. Yeah. And yeah, so I'll be playing everything in on MIDI. When I rec and then eventually once I've and that which I quite like doing that as well because sometimes I won't even bounce the audio of the synth down until the last minute. Sometimes I'll bounce it with the mix. Yeah. Um, this is when I'm obviously doing my own productions and I have that leeway. Yeah. But um, yeah, because then you can go, you know, as it's bouncing down, especially in real time, you can have a little, you can you can move things around a little bit, which is fun. Um, but most of the time I'm doing it and then bouncing it at some point. And yeah, there is latency, but. It is, it's just what it is unfortunately I just have to go okay it's usually like a couple of milliseconds out and I just have to move it just move so it annoying. so do you quantize your MIDI parts before yes. you're doing it 
So everything yes. really is within context. Is so if you move that audio region, everything yeah, is, is it, still in time. Yeah. Everything's going to be still in time. But occasionally, I'll, I'll I will not quantize things. But it's you know it's it's when the project doesn't matter for that. You know, it, it's it, a very it, fine it, line, isn't it, with life feel and out of time. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we're since more often than not it needs to be in time because it's i think there's something about them being electronic and i know most of the time people are trying to make synth sound more organic but but there, there's something about you know electronic music tends to be bang in bang in time yeah uh, so yeah i mean that's it though that's where the midi thing comes in handy so you can just you know play it in midi and then quantize fix it yeah. Usually quantizing the ends of notes as well to make sure that, especially if there's like the a lens. certain decay on each envelope and stuff, you want to yeah. kind of get that same thing. So I spend I'll spend a lot of time editing the MIDI before I bounce it down. Interesting, depending on what it and, is. But and as you know, as as we're on the subjects of um, synths, what kind of effects do you tend to use on synths? Like some people love to use delays, reverbs. Do you find that you're adding lots of effects to the synths that you're using? Obviously, again, it will depend in the context of the song. Uh, yeah, and, I mean, you know. You, yes is the answer really i mean i'm more often than not i'm adding some kind of reverb and if what it's kind plucky, of verbs short you... things oh well yeah uh, <laughs> i'm asking some big questions yeah yeah it's good i mean if i can if i can be bothered i'll use that so big sky uh but, hardware um, uh, yeah. um which I had, I, I, I had everything rooted through my pedals at some point, and I could just press a button and it did it. But I, I unhooked that not on purpose, <laughs> just so I had moved things around and haven't got around to doing it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it again, it depends on the project. But I mean, ninety nine percent of the time, still probably Valhalla vintage verb. Like that's my go to verb Everybody for pretty loves that much plug-in. everyone. Oh, it's just good. It just I think it's good. Po- po- probably it should win the best plugin award. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there it probably is, is. It's that or Fab Filter, isn't it? Like, I think that's it. But I think the, the glorious yeah. thing about Valhalla is it's cheap as well. You know, like the Fab Filter stuff is expensive, like 50 quid for Valhalla for and for across as many machines as you like. Don't they you know they, they're quite, I shouldn't say that, but they're quite le- you know, lenient with their licensing, how they do that. Yeah. Um, and they've got so many uh, presets as well and halls and rooms. Really good. And- I yeah. mean the vintage. There's the Vahala room, which is the room verb, and they've got yeah, the, the room's good. Vahala vintage. I, I find I don't use the Vahala room as much. The Vahala no. vintage verb. I'm using. I'm using the vintage all the time. That's all the, the that's, time. I yeah. I think my top, uh, uh, the top three. Throw a random number out there. Reverbs I'm using a, a Valhalla uh, Waves H reverb. I really like that. And I don't really use probably, that much. Oh, it's there. good. I I am. Um, yeah, it does certain things really well. It does very long reverbs really well. I think it's it's quite um, it's not necessarily the most realistic sounding, but that, it, it, so it's great for that. You know, it's 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 still clean. It's not really like a like a dirty reverb like where you kind of hear lots of like uh, digitalness to it. It's not that at all. It's just a really nice clean. But, yeah, have to try. Uh, yeah, and then uh, little plate sound toys again. Little plate, I really like the little plate. Yeah, yeah, that's a great. Uh, I like spring great. reverbs a lot as well, but I don't tend to use that with synths that often. People do like string loop with, with synths. I just don't. Are you using to. mainly plates, halls, and synths? Like, if if I was to say to you, what's your you know generic go to synth hall. reverb? Hall, hall. Yeah. I think hall. I mean, I I'm not a very big fan of plates actually. I mean, I use the little plate when I when I need that sound. I think because I think that's my favorite type of plate reverb yeah. I've found so far. But I don't tend to use them that often. Even on vocals, I know that plate vocals love plate reverbs, but I don't love plate. Are you do I use a vocals. plate and a hall? Yeah, I like I a horn, like both. a spring. <laughs> I like a spring reverb on a vocal. I'm a, I'm a, a yeah, seventies sort of sixties type person when it comes to that sort of thing. If it sounds good, it is good. Yeah, yeah. I, and spring reverbs are just great, actually, as well. I should say that a lot of people do like using spring reverbs on synths because they are a little bit more human sounding. I think you know, there's, it's, you know, they, they're a very particular sound, but I think they add a bit more real realness. For, um, for the listeners, is there a, a spring reverb you would uh, recommend people to look yeah. at? Is it is there a me? Sp- oh, I I, yeah. I would. I use a couple. I use two or three spring reverbs. One, so the one that uh, the Space Designer Logic spring okay. reverbs. I quite like them. They're okay. Um, I use Audio Thing Springs, um, 
which I have a love hate relationship with because sometimes it's just I'm sitting there for ages trying to make it sound good and it just doesn't doesn't and then oh. sometimes I put it on and it sounds oh great it sounds amazing so it's I think it's very Got much um, source dependent on what works with it yeah and then I have a guitar plugin which is um, Scuffum Amps S Gear Two uh, which is until I started using more um, like uh, amps and amp simulation pedals. Uh, my that was my main amp sim for a long time, but the spring reverb that comes on that uh, that's I used it for a lot for that now. So you can just turn the spring reverb on its own, and it sounds oh, good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's cool. That's, it's not. I'd love it, to have a real one. But. <laughs> it's so interesting talking to different producers and mixers mm. about the plugins they're using because there's just so many plugins and reverbs out there, isn't there? I mean, I know we said it earlier. That's it. But... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's it. And it, it's so easy to fall down into that hole of just oh, maybe I need that, maybe I need that, and I did it. You know, I, I, I. It's a good question. It's a question for you. How many plugins have you bought that you don't use now? How many? How like hardly ever use, or like like once in a this thousand sounds, projects? This sounds really bad, right? But out of all the plugins I've bought, seventy percent of them I probably don't use. I probably just use the twenty percent. Yeah. yeah. And and the only reason actually, and I you know I've said this before, you know the only reason why I always buy new plugins is. It's a bit like it's just toys for mixers, isn't it? It's like, oh, I'm I'm mixing every day. Inspiration. It, Inspiration. You know, it's just uh, you know, I want to use a different EQ today. All right. Yeah. No, <laughs> I get up, that. And, it, <laughs> and it's you know, and they all do the same the good, thing. <laughs> yeah, that's it. But I think that's sometimes it's just you know, you shouldn't say these things, but it's like sometimes I'm like, I really can't be bothered to mix this tune today. But I'm gonna buy this plugin and I really wanna use it. So that'll give me something to use it for. You know, and that's I mean it's, it's sometimes that's like, you know, like a little bit of inspiration. Don't say that to your clients, Joe. No, I, I can't say I can't I won't say that didn't happen. But um but uh, yeah, and it's just dangerous, isn't it? There's all these things you go, oh yeah, maybe that would, maybe that will save this mix. And yeah, <laughs> and sometimes I, just, yeah. I will say this time and time again, just as a you know production mixing, whether you're programming synths, don't forget the fundamentals. It's not mm -hmm. about the gear or the plugins that are, are used. It's the fundamentals, and if totally you get true. them right, then it doesn't. You, you know, stock plugins. I love stock plugins. I've yeah. got no reason not to. Oh, use they're really them. good. Actually, uh, the Logic Compressor is, is 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 superb. Actually, I think a lot of people. Yeah. I actually, I think a lot of people do use it. But it's, uh, I think, yeah, there is. Um, they, I, I think Logic is a wonderful program for having good built-in plugins and such. But, but yeah, yeah. I mean, what we're doing really, ninety-nine percent of the time, we're just equalizing and, and then dynamics. You know, equalization, dynamics, and then effects. You know. That's it. So, yeah. Mostly level. <laughs> that you know. is the levels and panning. <laughs> that that yeah. is the fundamental. No, don't me, yeah. <laughs> my, my, my plug it, my channel strip might look like it's got eight EQs and eight, eight compressors on sometimes, but it's, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> maybe not you... that many. <laughs> four and four, maybe. But, so yeah. do you find when you're uh, mixing synths, do you find you're doing much automation? Volume yeah. wise, panning wise, effects wise, um, plugin wise? I know. tend to use a lot of automatic processes when it comes to things like panning, I think. Um, there's like, um, depends on the situation, but I mean, I really like, again, Cable Guys, Shaper Box, that has a really good panner that you can kind of draw shapes. And I'll probably just draw this like a, uh, a, like a, like a flatter sine wave, and I'll assign that to like, like six beats or three bars so it kind of if it's moving if it needs to be moving gently or so then, is that or, moving left to right kind of thing? yeah but but yeah, yeah but it's like it's not going like far left far right it's just going a little bit like just wiggling through again uh, and I like that energy from, yeah yeah just like a little bit of extra movement um and then pan man is another sound toys oh one. yeah pan um, man, i use I that quite like that for for doing things like that um do you ever like literally pan a synth hard left hard right if you're doubling it doing stereo and, and yeah. if you've got like a a pluck sound do you ever just stick that into the right hand side just for space yeah definitely yeah, yeah. i mean it's, it's always going to be song dependent but it's of um course, yeah. i've probably said that too many times but you, you get it. <laughs> it it depends on the song it will be but, um, across the whole podcast yeah. like that it yeah, always yeah. depend <laughs> on the situation it always does <laughs> but yeah i mean i think actually one of the great things for like pad sounds and again going hardware but just record it twice and pan one side left pan one side right if it's an analog synth then it's going to sound different each time so it's i, I do a lot of that sort of stuff yeah, yeah. um the good i think i should shout about the profits they're not cheap things but but the the pan it's got a pan spread option on there so it basically automatically 
there's six oscillators on the Prophet six. That's what it's called, the six. Yeah. Uh, and it will just pan each of, each time a new note comes into a different spot, and it's quite nice. It's quite a handy little. Thing. Yeah, I yeah. wish there was some. There must be a MIDI plugin that does the same sort of thing. I think there is. But if you can do it on there. the hardware, yeah, it, exactly. You may as well and record it, it in everything. Like that. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, with the Prophet, I do a lot of that. But um, with software, since it's, they often have stuff inside it to do that as well. So, like, I I quite like. Say, if you're doing a, a an eighth note, like a dun, 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 synth. Yeah. Um, if you go into that synthesizer, there's probably a way of going LFO, assigning an LFO, uh, low frequency oscillator, to the panning. And if you choose random or, uh, what's the other word it's called? Um, I can't remember. It'll come back to me. But if you yeah, choose yeah. the shape, because, you know, LFOs tend to be sine waves or triangle waves or square waves to do certain things. But they often have a random option as well. Sample and hold, that's what I was looking for. That's Sometimes random is called sample and hold. But then... It, and if you can time it to being eighth notes, then it will just automatically be random each time where the note appears. Um, it's a lot of hand for, for those people watching the Twitch thing. It's a lot of hand movement <laughs> right now. Um, uh, yeah, so it will. Be, it, yeah, I, I like doing a lot of that sort of stuff. So it's automatically moving the notes to be in a different position across the board. And I think, I, especially for repetitive moments, that's quite nice. And it's quite nice to automate that as well so you might be going straight down the middle mm. and then when a vocal comes in it starts going all over the place so then it's getting out of the way of vocal essentially and uh, yeah, as yeah. well as being a fun widening thing you're kind of like creating a uh from an engineering point of view a, a mid-side eq you're yeah it actually <laughs> is yeah i mean yeah i mean this is it's doing a lot of that that's I mean, a really I, geeky thing to say isn't it <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. It's just yeah. It's it's, it's a really useful way of doing that, and it sounds cool. So um, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, panning stuff around. If you can do it within the synth, is great. Um, uh, I can't do it on the profit, but I can do it on this one. But it, I mean, alchemy can definitely do that. I'm pretty sure serum can do that as well. And you can just assign it to be uh, yeah, random or sample and hold. It'll just every time it plays, it'll appear in a different spot, which is handy. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. So for for the listeners now, so. What is, you know, to end this off, what is one mm -hmm. piece of advice that you would give the listeners who are either, you know, from beginner to advanced? What's mm -hmm. what's one bit of advice, or you can maybe say two things if you want, or See. that you that you wish you knew oh. when you started out to what you know now? Um, that's a big oh, question. I've put that's on the hard. Spot. No, no, no. It's fine. Um, I think <laughs> uh, I'm going to go back to well, we already talked about it, but I think learning to mix not in solo is is something that I think is is a wonderful thing. And uh, the quicker you can get used to, and I didn't do this for a long time actually, and I'm, I'm very happy to put my hand up. And I think it's a safety net thing of like, no, I, I can focus on one sound at a time. And I think it does take time to to, to learn how to listen to more than one thing. It sounds really silly, but you know, it's like when you like in a conversation, if three people are talking to you at once, it's quite hard to listen to all three of them. So you, yeah. it's easier just to focus in on one. Uh, and you know, that's like when my dog was barking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but it's true. so it's, it takes a while. But I think if you can spend, yeah. especially if you're in the fortunate scenario of having not very many tracks, so just a straightforward drums, bass, guitar, vocals thing, just really abstain from soloing anything like once you've got the production and the, the editing and if you're just in a mix stage just see how everything is affecting each other so i think that's definitely one it's easy because we already talked about it but it's i think it is a really Im important tool um yeah and uh a being i'll go with a being uh, Amazing. I think, listen, I'm glad yeah, you said I think, that. <laughs> yeah, I think because there's so much, there's so much advice, you know. There's, there's so many things, but I think the 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 best thing anyone can do is just listen to things, just listen to tracks, and figure out what you like about them. Figure out what you might not like about them. Like, it's, it's, I think I spent a lot of time listening to tracks, going if it's out there and it's it's you know been especially if it's been released by a major label, then it's good, right? And, and you find and you therefore you go, oh, I'm listening to the things that are good rather than actually listening to like listening out for things you may not like in a song. Well, well I don't like the way they mix that. It doesn't happen often with people like Spike Stent and Servan Ganea, right? But Best but it's gonna industry. be it's gonna <laughs> Yeah. It's gonna be elements of this like stuff that you go, oh, I might have done that differently. And it's good to know it's those a, things. It's a taste thing as well, isn't it? That and that's yeah. the thing about music and that's why it's so great, because it is your view on it, I guess. Yeah. 
It's just a taste yeah. thing. Once you know, okay, we go like a third bit of advice: learn your fundamentals, learn how to use an EQ, learn how compression works, and you relearn how to use actually re- learn how compression works, then relearn how compression works, and then after that, relearn how compression works a few times. Because <laughs> I don't know about you, I, I I felt like I went through several stages of how how compression works. Yeah, you know, yeah. we know how now. You know, we all know, but you know. The basic science of how compression works straightforward, right? But how how you can how it fits in a track is attack and release time. times and all of that Ugh. is yeah. That's so another that, whole. That's I'm another going whole. into that's about that's like four bits uh, of a whole this. podcast. But, isn't but it? stick yeah. <laughs> a being is uh, we'll go back to that. A being is is a wonderful thing because, uh, and I still don't think I do enough of it. But if you're wanting it to sit on the same playlists, Spotify playlists and other other tracks check it out check out you know get a track a few tracks up there especially for your low end and how you, i think low end and your balance between instruments that's what i do a lot of things it's like okay so i'm working on this track it sounds a bit like taylor swift shake it off it doesn't but it's that's you know for example yeah and uh what i will you know i think it was, it's too easy to check eq between things and actually i think the best thing to think, go is what is the relationship between the kick drum and the vocal or the kick drum and the snare? And okay, how, how are those relationships working? And maybe I can implement that into my track. Yeah. And you don't have to. A lot of the time I'll AB for the, for Just the, the first session part of the mix. Or, yeah, yeah. And then I'll ignore the, 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 the reference track. But I think it's a good place to get your initial start point going. And then you can refer back to it if you're kind of thinking, if you're getting a little bit lost, I think it's there, that's when it gets useful again. But, yeah. Well, Joe, thank you so much for coming no worries, on to this episode. To uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on, and I'm sure the listeners are going to find everything amazing and all the advice that you said Hopefully. fantastic. Yeah. They, they will. They will. I loved it. It's been uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. A nice one, man. And uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. It's been, it's been, I've been looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it. Thank you very much for all the listeners listening, and uh, I'll be back with another episode very soon.